We're going to turn back to the book of Ruth this morning uh, and we're going into Ruth chapter 3. Many years ago when our, our children were younger we were, um, <clears throat> we were driving um, through Switzerland um, and uh, I love mountains um, and we were driving straight away through really but I said to the family I can't resist let's, let's kind of climb one of these mountain peaks drive up uh, one of these mountain peaks. Well, it, it was, let's say it was hairy because every kind of twist and hairpin, it was, uh, and my poor old car was struggling away in first gear. Um, one of those situations where the wife said, please don't do that again. Um, lots of twists and turns. This little book is a little bit like that, isn't it? There, there, there are so many twists and turns um, in it we could just focus on, on, on the whole kind of issue of migration and immigration. Uh, what, what, a, what a kind of a, a difficult pathway to tread. Uh, or we could talk about the whole issue of bereavement uh, and the incredible pain that it brings into our lives. Uh, or we could just mention the kind of life struggles that actually go on and we've seen some of life's struggles here and as we come back into the book this morning I, I need to ask you to do two things um, and the first is this we need to put ourselves in the light of that into Ruth's shoes into Ruth's shoes because at any kind of level in which you understand this story it, it is quite extraordinary in, in terms of the things it actually tells us. You wouldn't want to be really, would you, in Ruth's shoes, uh, the loss of a husband, the, 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 the fear of the prospect of the future, coming into a new culture, leaving her home. There's all sorts of the things that are going on. But above all that, above all that, of course, the writer is saying to you and I, wait a minute, when you think about this lady, add this, with all that around us, here is a lady who has just come to profess trust and faith in God. Her, her life so far almost, you would have thought, would put her off that. But clearly she doesn't. And, and that's one of the things, the lovely things that the book works out. We've looked at that to a degree, haven't we? This whole issue, of, and it, we'll touch it again this morning, of, of the Christian uh, um, providence. But then we need to put ourselves out of Ruth's shoes into our own shoes. And we need to do that for this reason, because whatever you say about this particular chapter, there must, one thing must have struck you, mustn't it? What on earth is going on when this godly matriarch, now can you, can, oh sorry, let's make this person, can you imagine some of the more senior ladies here this morning saying to some of you younger ladies, I tell you what, do you know that fella that you know, why don't you go and actually lie by him for a night and just see what happens? <laughs> now that of course is an incredible struggle, isn't it? It's a struggle, of course, for Christians in terms of it, the morality of it. It's a struggle for us in terms of what actually was Naomi thinking through and what, what you know, and, and Rose's willingness to, to, to acquiesce to it. You think, what, what on earth is going on? So let's come and look into this passage. But again, you forgive me because of the nature of it. Before we do, you need to have two tickets to enter this passage. All right? You must have two tickets to take into you if this passage is going to open up to you. And the first of those tickets is this. Please let's come to this passage and remember the dire straits, and I don't mean Mark Knopfler and co, as much as I love them, the dire straits in which these two women are to be found. That's evident in three simple ways. One, they were women living in a man's world. And I don't mean by that the kind of way we use it today, okay, which is very different. Here were women living in a man's world who now at this present had absolutely no security. No state to fall back on because there was no family seemingly to fall back on and that culturally was their huge safety net. 
Here are women without any security. That's the nature of their dark But also here are women who are childless. For them, that meant there was no way of a future posterity. There was no way of actually going on. Uh, that, that, kind of, that, I tell you, that really hit me hard a few years back when I first went out to Nepal. And I realised, it, it, still in large parts of the rural communities of Nepal, children, family, particularly boys, the, the impact of that was phenomenal in terms of prospects for the future, or the lack of it, not so. And the other thing is, of course, that here's these women who are in dire straits. Why? Because they've got no land of their own. They've got nothing to till. Uh, Tesco's was unheard of, of course. The land was their future prosperity, and they had none. That's the first ticket we've got to take with us as we go into the chapter. The second ticket is this. We need to be sensitive to understand the different cultural world in which this story took place. One of the great mistakes that people often make about the Bible is they forget it's a book in which God has revealed his truths which are eternal in place and time. And that means sometimes we have to see, okay, well, what actually, if we take in the cultural setting and historic setting, what is it saying to them and what's it saying to us? And there are two particular issues here in this chapter that we need to hold on to because then it, the chapter's not going to make sense. The first is that Ruth and Naomi lived in a day and a society when um, the brother in law, let me put it in, the brother in law was all important. Uh, I, I have a super brother-in-law, um, but if we were living in those days um, and he wasn't married, if I was to pass away before my wife, society would have expected him to actually step up to the plate, so to speak, and marry um, my wife. It's called, in scripture terms, it's called the, the law of the liver right. And, and it's not mentioned a lot of times, but it is mentioned at least three times. Once it's mentioned in the cultural setting of the entire story of the Bible, in Genesis 38, with a lady called Tamar. The second time it's mentioned in, actually, God's law, when he tells his people, look, for the well-being of your society, and particularly for the love and care of widows, this is something that can be done. And the third time's here. So in other words, you and I need to start by reminding ourselves that for Naomi, when she makes this suggestion, and we'll talk about some of the logistics of it, that's where she's coming from. She's not doing anything that actually was thought inappropriate. She wants to find security and hope for her daughter-in-law in the future. But the second thing we need to take with us, culturally, is this. And it's to do with the whole role of Boaz in this story, particularly in this chapter. Because Boaz here, culturally, is fulfilling, again, a very important role in terms of the society in which he lived. He is what um, the Hebrews would have called the Goel, or basically you could describe that as protector or a relative who redeems us. It's interesting that actually um, as you search the Old Testament you find that this role that Boaz takes up was done on a number of occasions. It was done, one, to restore land to those who have lost it, i.e. a widow. It was done, two, to buy back a person who had been put into slavery because they were poor, i.e. Uh, a relative, or particularly, again, a widow. It was fulfilled when the living relatives sought to find justice for a relative who had been murdered or, 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 or accidentally died. And then it was also 
grow to restore wrong. So here is a man who again is culturally bound in this chapter. If he'd have actually said in this chapter, what are you doing? Get, get lost. The whole testimony of this man being a godly person would have been lost. The reality that this man is someone that you and I as Christian people today should seek to understand and follow and learn from is that he is a godly man and that's shown here. So I'm sorry, it's a bit of a long introduction, but I kind of kind of felt as we get into this. Okay, so let's get into this to the story in the heat of the night. Okay, you know by now I, I, I am a great film. It's one of the great classic films, isn't it? If you're of my age, is Sidney Poitier's In the Heat of the Night. He's, what a superb, superb actor the man was, and when he and Rod Stark get going on that whole film, if you're not seeing it. It's one of those things you can watch about. It's just a brilliant piece of acting. The whole tension, the racial tension in the South. It's just, it's just fantastic. Here's, here's, let's come into this, this chapter three. In the heat of the night. What happens in the heat of the night? Well, here's the first thing that we're going to see in the first five verses. Faith struggle in the heat of the night. How are you and I, uh, as Christians, to understand what, what in many ways is one of the trickiest passages in the Old Testament in terms of justifying what Naomi suggests, uh, suggests uh, earlier on? Uh, you know, as a Christian uh, lady here this morning, would you suggest this to a younger lady? No, quite clearly <laughs> you would not. We, we, we should be shocked, surprised, even the great commentator, the great uh, Christian commentator Matthew Henry says this, this is a very extraordinary circumstance and looks incredibly suspicious. What is Naomi asking or telling Ruth to do? On the surface level you could be saying, well actually, do you know what, surely she's, she's, she's putting her in the way of temptation. She's saying to her, okay, we're in a difficult situation here. You know, ends justify the means. Go for it, girl. What is interesting as you look into the text is that the writer in the original language is deliberately ambiguous as he explains the circumstances. Now, let me just show you what that is. If you look into verse 4 and verse 7 and verse 8, you will find... Um, depending on which version, but the, it says, uh, go and uncover his feet. Feet. And again, I think it, it, the word is used in verse 7 and 8, um, uncovered his feet. Now, we think that's okay, but actually, you can translate that word as leg. It's done so in Daniel, Jan, Daniel 10. And, and, and you can do that because the word that's used kind of has this, in which it has this both meaning. And, and it's interesting that the writer chooses that word because he is not wanting to convey to you and I that he is condemning Ruth's suggestion, uh, sorry, Naomi's suggestion, nor is he condoning Naomi's suggestion. He's saying, look, this is an extraordinary situation, but before we come of it with a little speck in our eye and say, oh, look at the beam in this act, wait a minute, he says, just hold on. Because at the best intention, sorry, in the best light, Naomi's intention could be seen as foolish, kind of, just kind of interfering. At the worst if I can put it in this kind of little allegory, a sanitised version. At the worst, here is Naomi's suggestion to a pretty little flower that she offers some nectar to the busy bee called Boaz. But actually there's a third way to understand it and that's the way we need to take. Because what we are being led to see here is nothing less 
than a bold act of faith's carpe diem. I'm going to, I've said that wrong, I know, probably you, you Latin people. Faith grabbing the day. Here is faith in the extremity of its circumstances seeking to find a way forward. It's interesting that two of the most, two of the best contemporary commentators on this passage, one being John Piper and the other one being Sinclair Ferguson, they take two different routes. Piper says this, he says, this is a bold, incredible plan of Naomi's. Sinclair Ferguson says, well, there's, there's a rashness to Naomi's plan. And, and that's exactly the point. Here is Ruth carrying, sorry, here is Naomi carrying out an act of faith which to anybody else outside the circumstances seems crazy. Uh, don't you see an example of that? I didn't know we were doing that one this morning. That's exactly, isn't that Peter's issue? Seize the day. Let me walk on the water to you, Lord. You don't think the disciples in the boat weren't thinking, Peter, you nuts guy? No, of course not. Sometimes we're in those things in this church. And, and notice two possible ways to help us get into this bold act of faith, whereby we should learn and not look and think, that's not on. Notice this, first of all, Naomi's, what is Naomi doing? Naomi here is struggling to work out her faith in the belief of God's sovereign providences. You're getting used to me, so I'll use this illustration, and if you've got problems with it, you can tell me afterwards. As a kid growing up, um, uh, one of the things I got into as a teenager was playing a card game called Bridge. It, it's a very, it's like an intellectual card game. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, basically, you're dealt a hand, and the whole point is to logistically try and work out the best way to play it. That's why I was no good at it. <laughs> I was got beat. And you play it with the partners if you're not. Anyway, that's what Naomi's doing here. She has been dealt a clear hand of providence by her God. And her struggle is how does she work this out in faith? Here you are. You're walking along in your Christian life, and suddenly out of nowhere, you lose your job. That's God's providence. But how? How do I play the hand? How do I work it out? That's what's happening here. You see, one of the hardest things in the Christian life, isn't it, is, is guidance. What do we do as you walk by faith when we're confronted with issues that aren't clear and straightforward? Notice what Naomi does, okay? To try and help us understand and learn this. First of all, Naomi was seeking to trust God within the confines of this provision. Lord, here we are. We, we, I've got Ruth here, and, 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 and who's going to care for a future? I'm not going to be here forever. What can I do? How can I work this out? And she comes upon this bold idea. But, here's the important thing, this bold idea she seeks to carry out within the, within the parameters of the truth that God has revealed. Now what's that? The truth is this, that God has said to his people, look, here's a provision I'm giving you. If it ever happens that a, 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 a lady finds herself bereft of a husband, one way it can be done is for the family, a relative, a redeemer, to come and look after her. You see, you see what I'm trying to say? She's saying, from, let's understand Naomi, she's saying, Lord, I haven't got an exact verse. I can't say, Lord, you said this in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 3. But what I can take is the principle, the truth. You care, you've made a provision. How can I work out? And that's where I believe, as you understand where she's coming from. And notice this too. She's reliant, of course, upon the godly character of Boaz. She's not throwing herself out onto this, as it were, on the street of life. She says, no, no, I, I'm, I'm seeking the Lord to work my faith out. I'm looking to the great truths that actually you, you've said. 
let, let me kind of look at this particular issue. Here's a man of faith. Here's a man who's going to seek to honour you too. And she has this hunch, of course, that Boaz, because he's a godly man, is going to respond as he does. In other words, what we're seeing here is this. It's, it's, it's that great truth that, that, that um, a lot of people repeated over the years about providence and faith. Providence is our diary. Providence is not our Bible. Providence is something I record and look back upon. When it's happening, I can't do that in the same way. I don't take it as to, for instance, a stupid example. I go out and get in my uh, to get my car this morning, and outside my car is is, is a, a million pounds. Oh well, the Lord's dropped that into my lap. I'll take that. That's mine. No, that that's that's ridiculous, isn't it? Providence is a wonderful diary, but it can be a bad teacher. The Bible is a tremendous teacher and says, actually, we need to work our providences in what the light of what it says. And that means there's a second thing that's happening here for Naomi. She's working out her faith within the providences that God had given to her, but also she's a woman of hope. One of the most precious things that God gives to his people, no matter who they are, or where they are, or what happens to them, is that God, where you find God's people, you always find hope. Christian hope isn't a vague thinking that it might be all right. Or even I hope it's going to be all right. No, Christian hope is something that is built upon the solid promises that God has said, you are my people and I will be your God and I assure you, I absolutely assure you because of the nature of the God I am, that no matter how dark the times, light will be seen. That's why hope sometimes has to wait patiently in its circumstances. Lord, I don't understand what's going on, but, but, but i just got to trust you in this. Sometimes, here, hope has to be bold and step out and make very interesting suggestions. This is not the act, Naomi, it's not the act of a desperate woman. It's the act of a woman who has great hope and trust in the great God. And, and there will be times in your life and mine when we'll be in those extraordinary, they're not everyday circumstances. But the point that's coming out is this, isn't it? That the hardest part sometimes for the Christian in terms of a sovereign God and his providence is not so much in not knowing what God's providence is, but in submitting to it in hope. Isn't that the, that's the hardest thing sometimes, isn't it? So faith, struggle in the heat of the night. I'll try and be a bit quicker, sorry. Secondly, in the main part of the chapter, faith holds fast in the heat of the night. Let me ask this question. Do you know, uh, I'll put this one, no. Do you remember those, I don't, I don't watch, is Blue Peter still a kids program? I don't know. Kid, I don't know. It, 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 uh, did you kind of um, grow up with Blue Peter as a kid? Do you know when they did those things and, and, and they used to say, well, here's one I made earlier. Or they'd say, look, we're going to do this, but actually don't try this at home. Is this a model between Naomi and Ruth and Boaz? Is this a model for Christian courtship? And the answer is absolutely no, it's not. Don't try this at home. But let's see what the writer is actually saying to us. 
And we can do that by considering the two characters, Boaz and Ruth. First of all, notice in the heat of the night, the delicate discretion of Ruth's faith shines bright. See how that comes. Here she is. She's a new follower of Jehovah, the God of Israel. And a mother-in-law comes and says, Ruth, I need to help you out here. Do you know that guy Boaz you met? Well, actually, I'll tell you what. What I want you to do is actually go and, um, go and smite yourself up. Go and have a shower. Go and, well, sorry, go and have a bath. Put on your best clothes. Put on your glad rags, girl. Put on your best smelly perfumes. Get it, get it, get it, get it all together. And then I want you, and this must have been, you can imagine what Ruth's thinking when she listens to this. I want you then to go down to the threshing floor, it's harvest time, uh, and watch where Boaz is, and when he's finished his day, and he's finished his food, and he goes and lies down, I want you to go and lie down at his feet and pull up the cover and put it over you. What's Ruth's response going to be? Notice, faith listens to those who are more spiritually mature, experienced. It doesn't mean, of course, that they're always right, but it does mean there's a principle here that those who've been on the walk of faith longer than us have gained more experience and sometimes they will tell us or suggest things or explain things and we just can't get it. And notice that Ruth too is willing to be taught. She's willing to listen to what kind of no, let me suggest. Now, if you're a parent here this morning and you've got teenagers or you've brought up teenagers, you know that actually sometimes the greatest challenge to your faith is that, isn't it? Because if you're a teenager, you've naturally got to be rebellious. That's, that's the way we are, all of us. I always find it funny when I talk to my kids and, and they say things, or what, particularly when young, I think, actually, do you know what? I know exactly what you're thinking because I did the same myself. And the challenge to our faith sometimes as we try to teach our youngsters is when they kind of just don't get it. And you see then how brightly Ruth's faith shines. That actually she doesn't say to Naomi, are you crazy? She doesn't say, this is totally wrong. No, 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 she's, she's waiting, she's listening. And then comes, if you like, what I call the piece of resistance. Here's where Ruth's faith shines the brightest because she goes down to the flashing floor and actually she kind of puts the covers over uh, 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 and so on. Uh, and in the middle of the night, and we'll come to that little verse in a minute, Boaz wakes up. Who's there, he says. And you get these words in verse 9. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me or in some versions it's got that beautiful phrase spread your wings over me and the beauty of her faith is this that right here she's doing two things one she's repeating to Boaz the very words chapter 2 and verse 12 he's already said to her she, she's on the same line. Do you know, Boaz, do you know like you said to me, God will spread his wings over you. That's the sort of God he is. She quotes the same words back to him. That must have echoed in, in him, yeah? But secondly, it's this, isn't it? Naomi hadn't told her to say that. So why? His faith at work, you see. Here's faith thinking and reasoning and it comes to this incredible moment and it is, it's a moment full of tension and potential, isn't it? You know, I tell you what, you know, Hollywood couldn't get that, this right, could it? You can imagine the scene. And she suddenly says to, to actually more than she's been told. She actually speaks out and says, spread your wings over me. It's a call of faith, you see. It is... An incredible pregnant moment, isn't it? Verse 9 and 10. But if Ruth's faith shines bright in the heat of the night, 
Boaz's godly integrity shines bright in the heat of the night too. He's come back from a hard day's work. It's been a good day's work. The harvest is a plentiful one. He sat down with his workers and he's, they've fed and, and they, you know, you do, you're at the end of a day's work, you've, you've had a good time, you've, you've friendship, fellowship, and he goes to lie down in the darkness. Rural darkness. Real darkness. Um, we're not used to that. Uh, I can remember what sleep we sl- many years ago, sleeping in the outback of Australia, and that's darkness. No natural light around. And he lies down in the darkness, and then he's woken up. And, and that word there, he was startled. You, you you can't help but think, is this kind of just a writer's way of saying, okay, God's at work here, or let's just see what happens. And I'm not sure, but he's startled. And as he wakes up, of course, what hits him? It's that sweet fragrance of a woman's perfume. It's dark, and this woman speaks. Now, I don't need to go any further, do I? But actually, if you've got any, any experience of the male-female relationship, you know exactly the, what kind of the tension, the pregnancy that's here. What would you do? Well, I'd say this. Notice this. First of all, Boaz did not, excuse me, put it this way, did not wear Nikes. He didn't wear Nikes. He didn't just do it. Something that's at work here. And what is at work is nothing less than a Holy Spirit inspired through faith integrity that belongs to those who seek to follow the Lord Jesus. There's poise in his life that only comes through grace and through one who's given himself to understand God's word and his ways. He keeps his spiritual wits about him, doesn't he? You know, who are you, he says. And notice the, the, the incredible gracious discretion he shows. He doesn't shout out and, you know, oh, I can't be seen in this compromised situation. Hey, guys, look! No, he doesn't actually say, okay, let's, let's get this on. No, 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 no. What's he, he's concerned about Ruth. He's concerned about the appearance of evil, of doing the right thing. But he's controlled, too, by this desire and longing to do the right thing before God and for her good. And he says to her, doesn't he, and, and it gives you an idea that there was a big age gap between them. He says, my daughter, I can't believe this, you've not run after the younger guys. You've come to me. Let me actually try and do what you asked for me. <laughs> do you remember how we began this and I said to you, um, it's like a rom-com. I, I, kind of, I was a little bit kind of pushing it a bit, because really, you know, it's much more than the rom-com, isn't it? Here's romantic integrity. Hollywood would hate it. There's no blistering sex, certainly no premarital kind, but there is seductive charm, wholesome respect for tradition and procedure, and a knowing grasp of human nature. That's what this guy called Don Carson wrote. And it is, isn't it? I I was trying to think this through and and, and, and kind of get a handle on it to give a little straight to to bring out. And the only thing I think of was this. A number of years ago when I was pastoring uh, at Emmanuel Church, we used to do open airs every Sunday during the summer. Uh, and uh, we'd be outside on a big grassed area uh, and we'd preach and, and, and share and sing and, and talk to people. And one time we were there, there was a young fellow we had with us, who's, 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 I think he was the BBC now, but uh, he was a young student, a young guy called Hugh. 
Uh, and he was on the, like the perimeters with tracks and, and, you know, talking to people. And I happened to be there too. And this group of youngsters come along, typical kind of Gabalva kids, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19. All they cared about was drink, drugs and sex, rock and roll. And, and they got engaged in a conversation with this young fella. And of course, boys being boys, they got onto all the kind of things that weren't so appropriate. And I, can, I, I remember sitting, standing there, we sat on the wall, standing there, and they, they started to mock him. They started to mock him because they basically got onto this whole thing. Oh, well, you know, come on, man, are you, let me put it discreetly, are you still a virgin? Come on, let's get on with it, get it. What are you on about? And I can remember the way they were mocking him. I thought, what's this young fella going to do? And the calmness with which he responded and took the insults. And he suddenly said this, he said, okay, laugh at me if you will. But what if I'm right and you're wrong? What if I'm right that there is a God in heaven who cares about us and says the very best plan for our lives is a path of sexual purity until that moment we become married? And I never forget these kids. You could see, of course they've got to laugh it off, but you could see in their kind of demeanour, this kid's got something to say here. My dear Christian, particularly my younger brother, sister or Christian, it's a struggle sometimes in a world like this, isn't it? To, 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 to even, you know, the whole nature of the Christian ethic in terms of our morality, our sexual morality is so under the cosh. It's not easy. But actually, there is an integrity that God has given that is worthwhile holding on to. And, and if you're here this morning and you're thinking, well, do you know what, Pastor, I've totally lost that battle. Do you know the wonderful thing about being a Christian? Is that God forgives. One of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament is where Paul's writing to a group of Christians who come from all sorts of backgrounds. He says, you know what, some of you were uh, sexually immoral, some of you were, were all sorts of, of, of deviation, but such were some of you. You've been forgiven. You've been changed. And the wonderful thing about the Christian message is that while it calls for this sort of lifestyle that Boaz is, 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 is displaying here, it also says, you know, if we mess up, there is a God who forgives and a God who has us back. That's why the whole nature of your relationship this morning, if you're not a Christian, and mine, before I was a Christian, God describes as this whole matter of faithfulness adultery and spiritual adultery and faithfulness. Let's look at a last thing. A last thing. The prospect of redemption shines bright in the heat of the night. That's what the book's all about. Notice what happens. Um, and the writer again, as so often uh, the Old Testament writers, he, he's making a play on words. Again, actually... Um, Ruth leaves a freshing floor, and before she does, Boaz says, look, okay, take some, take some grain with you. Now, we're not actually told how much grain she's given. The best two estimates are, on the one hand, he's given her something like 80 pounds worth. On the other hand, he's given her 200 pounds worth. I don't know what they are in kilograms, forgive me. Some farm teacher I am, but anyway. Uh, um, he's given her a huge amount. It clearly, it's probably not 200 pounds, you can't imagine struggling back with that. But the point the writer is making is this, he's given her an extraordinary amount that she's going to take back home to Naomi, the lady who's instigated all this. And of course, this is the same Naomi who said publicly, do you know what, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara, bitter because the Lord sent me away full and he's brought me back empty. And here is Boaz saying this message of hope to this dear lady, Naomi, I've got it. I know what you want me to do. 
You want me to act as a kinsman redeemer, but I, and I'm willing to do it, but I've got to suss out, first of all, whether there's a closer relative and whether he wants to do it. But I want to give you this message of hope, Naomi. And here it is. The God who you think has given you a rough deal and dealt you a bad hand, he has got ample provision to make you and give you hope for the future. And because Boaz gives hope to Naomi, Naomi in turn gives hope to Ruth. I noticed someone when this was being read near me, kind of when they heard these words, there was a, a, a knowing acknowledgement. The chapter ends, doesn't it, in verse 18. Naomi said, wait my daughter until you find out what happens. Here's the words. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Here is Naomi saying, Ruth, because of the nature of the God whom we worship, because he's a caring, loving God who, who's, who's always thinking the best for us and wants to the best for us and because of the nature of the man Boaz who is a godly man who follows this God he won't rest until this is sorted out he won't be one of those fly by night friends who suddenly says oh I'm really sorry about your situation that's really sad and then goes away and forget no 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 he will not rest and the writer puts it this way because he's saying, okay, let's see what happens in the next chapter, how he works it out. But let's leave on this note. This story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi resonates the wonderful prospect of the hope of redemption that belongs to you and I today because of what Jesus Christ has done. He will not rest. It's, if you like, uh, in that respect, here's a faint echo that points or sounds out Jesus. How difficult my circumstances may be, how painful is the whole prospect of bereavement, how fearful my future may be, how uncertain it is, but here is this great promise from God that Jesus Christ, his son, the Redeemer, is one who will not rest, never rest until he worked and made this work of redemption. There's this wonderful way in which the gospel writers portray Jesus uh, uh, near the end of his life as he makes his way towards Jerusalem. And there's all sorts of obstacles in his way and even his disciples are saying, Lord, let's not go. But no, step by step, pace by pace, he makes his way to Jerusalem because he would not rest until he has carried out an act of redemption. He's ransomed his people. My friend this morning, if you're not a Christian, uh, we've been looking at, an, at historic texts in, in, you know, in history. But it's saying to you and I, hey, do you know what, there's, th there's something to think about here, friend. The Christian message, ultimately, and you might want to challenge me in this, and I'd love to talk to you about it. It is an arrogance to say that God alone is the only one who is able to redeem, to buy back and make us whole. He will not rest. And, 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 and let me close with this. There's a beautiful way that's put by the Apostle Peter, we heard about this morning, when he wrote to St. Christians near the end of his life. He said, look, I want you to remember, this is 1 Peter 1, 16 and 17. He says, you were not redeemed. This is what all this is about. You were not brought back. You weren't ransomed by silver and gold. But you were ransomed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ who has paid the price for your sin to bring you back to him. Because why? Because this man, Jesus, did not rest and even now does not rest.
Because even now, if you're here this morning and you're, you know, you may be kicking this all over and saying, come on, mate, get out of the way. Oh, please, yeah, do that, it's fine. But leave this thought. Even now, Jesus Christ, by his spirit, is wrestling with your spirit. I want you, he says. I want to love you. I want to show you the best type of life. I want to give you the, the good things, even in life's difficultest and darkest moments. All glory and praise be to Jesus. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we confess that we've travelled far and wide in this story this morning. But we ask now by your Holy Spirit, you will help us to focus upon the wonderful way it worked, your, your grace worked out in the life of this man and these two women and the wonderful way in which your word uses that to speak to us of the great hope there is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that you will speak to us and have mercy upon us. Draw us to yourself and help us to know the joy that it is to walk with Jesus, the one who does not rest until he has brought us to see him face to face in heaven's glory. For we ask this in his precious name. Amen.